Welcome to the week seven module. In this module, we'll be talking about economics and healthcare policy, healthcare reform, and some global issues, and the topic of expanding the vision. So, why do we need to discuss the economics of healthcare? As nurses, it's important to begin to understand the basics of economics in order to analyze how supply and demand affect our ability to provide care. So, this section will assist you in examining some economic concepts and integrating them with clinical, environmental, and behavioral knowledge into your practice. So some overall factors in healthcare economics. We can look at increasing cost and we know that the annual per capita expenditures for healthcare in the United States is one of the highest in the world. We know technology is increasing at a speed we can barely keep up with. U.S. prescription drugs are multiplying and consumers are exposed to these options in the media. Chronic disease and the aging population create additional costs. So what about some of those societal changes? So with the population, we know that the aging population is growing. And for the elderly, chronic illness versus acute illness is now a major factor for them. Those older than 65 require a greater proportion of resources, both in and out of the hospital, and health promotion behaviors can limit, prevent, or delay disability. We also know that internet resources make options available to those who choose to want to seek out additional care, and with the formal education levels increasing, people are more savvy about what they can read about and maybe request of their health care providers. So we talk about the um, rising percentage of the elderly and you've probably heard talk about the influence of the baby boomers. So the first baby boomer became eligible for Medicare on January in 2011. And the term baby boomer just really came about after World War II ended and it was that more babies were born in 1946 than ever before, 3.4 million. This was 20% more than in 1945. And so this began the baby boom. In 1947, there was another 13.8 million babies, and it continued to rise up until 1964. So at this point in 1964, there were 76.4 million baby boomers who made up almost 40% of the nation's population. So now it is that they are beginning to age, and some of the issues that we see, such as retirement, health promotion needs, how does it affect the economy, longevity has increased, so we know we have more individuals living longer, and then as mentioned, the chronic disease implications. So let's think about um, the following influences. We know there's increasing technology, and with that we need um, further research um, and development. So evidence-based care gives way to more needs. Mentioned prescription drugs. Um, so consumers are now exposed to these options in the media regularly. And it is estimated about 7% of healthcare expenses are for administrative costs. So those um, will increase as well. We have a greater demand for um, healthcare providers. And with that can come access of um, concerns about access. As far as our healthcare environment, mentioned inflation with um, that increased cost, it may decrease research and technology. There's an increase in the cost of durable medical equipment. Providers have to accept reductions in reimbursement, and then there are unfunded mandates. So health promotion, preventative care is a mandate. Electronic health records are another example of an unfunded mandate. So the concern is, will there be access to care? When we have newly insured individuals, we know we have increased demand. There's going to be concerns about availability and access. How is equity introduced? And then we have to think about redefining care systems. So medical home is often described as a philosophy of care, primary care, that's patient-centered, comprehensive, team-based, coordinated, accessible, and focused on quality and safety. 
Meaningful use is talking about the electronic health record technology and the idea is to improve quality, safety, efficiency, and reduce health disparities. So this can help to coordinate care in a more meaningful way. And also think about the provider. So if there are more individuals seeking care, there is an increased demand for services. As mentioned earlier, there may be um, decreases in reimbursements and consider the costs that go into providing care for all of those individuals. We can have a concern about supply of providers. So if individuals aren't accepting Medicare or Medicaid, are they following a particular um, practice model or their own scope of practice? There's a need we know for um, primary care, family practitioners, but oftentimes we see an increased growth in specialists. Who are the other healthcare providers that can pick up this slack? We've seen the growth in the use of advanced practice nurses, specifically NPs and physician's assistants. And then think about what the disparities are when you consider rural versus urban locations. So we've heard a lot about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA, and um, the Center, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services speaks about benefits of the ACA. And so some of these help to address care and access, coverage, so an example is individuals under 26 years old previously were not um, covered under their parents after the age of 21, so that did increase. Um, increase some coverage from them. There are consumer protections as well. Goodman, however, talked about some issues with the ACA. So he talks about that it is an impossible mandate, that health care costs have been increasing at almost twice the rate of um, income, and the idea of this um, ACA is to restrict the government outlays, however, it means that individuals be, be paying more. It talks about differential subsidies on the economy, so businesses may discover that everyone who earns less than the average wage gets a better deal from the government than those who earn more. So some of these insurers may charge the same premium regardless of health status because they're required to accept anyone who applies, but they may overcharge the healthy and undercharge the sick. And they also want to have strong incentives to attract the healthy, so those that we, they can make a profit on, and avoid the sick because they incur losses. The, there's incentives for small businesses to stay small and only have part-time workers. And then there is um, the other avenue is that we do want to increase access to care, but there may not be seeing this. So some talk about there may be increases in um, wait times, and some individuals may turn to concierge care, but every time a doctor decides to become a concierge doctor, they'll give better access to approximately 500 patients, but then there's about 2,000 who are looked to fend for themselves. The other is about the burden for the elderly and the disabled. So about half the cost of the ACA is paid for by cuts in Medicare, and the only way these cuts can be made is by reducing fees to providers. So the Medicare um, actuaries have noted that Medicare fees to doctors will drop below Medicaid levels in the near future, so the combined effect of lower Medicare and Medicaid hospital spending can drive hospitals from the market in the next five years. So accountable care organizations have evolved as a component of the Affordable Care Act, and they're looking at shared savings organizations designed to promote accountability, risk management, and coordinated care. So the goal is high quality, efficient care to keep Medicare recipients out of the hospital. So let's talk for a moment about Medicare. So Medicare is available for Americans age 65 or older and those with certain disabilities or those with end-stage renal disease. So Part A provides for inpatient hospitals, skilled rehabilitative hospice and home care services. 
Part B covers outpatient care and necessary and selective preventive services and equipment. Part C is the Advantage Plan, um, and then Part D is the Optional Prescription Drug Coverage Plan. Medicaid was authorized in 1965 under the Social Security Act with funding and programs provided at the state and local levels with some federal funding and regulated through eligibility requirements. So the recipients are pregnant women, children, patients and caregivers, seniors, for example, those in long-term care, and those with disabilities. The Children's Health Insurance Plan, otherwise known as CHIP, um, was originally act enacted in 1997 under the Social Security Act to provide health coverage for uninsured children who are not eligible for Medicaid and it did get extended under the ACA to continue in fiscal year, up through fiscal year 2019. So the ANA has um, set aside principles for health system transformation. We know that this is a um, frequent talk about um, revising and reforming our um, healthcare system. So the ANA has general principles that are shown here, ensure universal access to a standard package of essential health care services. So these um, services do include mental health services. It looks at um, prohibiting denial coverage because of a pre-existing condition. It encourages um, inclusion of children up through age 26 and expanding Medicaid as a safety net for the most vulnerable. It does optimize primary community-based and preventive services while looking at the cost-effective use of innovative technology-driven acute hospital-based services. So it speaks about primary health care and removing barriers that restrict practice. 